I am Michael Kurosh. I live in Santa Barbara, California, one of the most beautiful places on earth. My design center is where people come to reimagine their homes and spaces. I work with the best designers, clients with broad tastes, and experts who navigate the fascinating world of design. I'm always excited to learn something new, and I never say no to a challenge. This is Design Santa Barbara. Welcome to Design Santa Barbara. I'm Michael Kurosh and today we are in Santa Barbara Design Center where I'm excited to share with you an episode dedicated to great French artists of the 19th century. Please join us. Paris in the 1800s was the focal point of Western art. From this incredible city came masters of Impressionism, Surrealism, Post-Impressionism, and more. Now let's look at the life and times of Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Born into an aristocratic family, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec showed signs of artistic talent at the age of eight. Noted painter René Prince II gave the young Lautrec informal lessons. At the age of 17, Lautrec painted this portrait of Prince II, and two years later, Prince II painted this portrait of Lautrec. Due to a genetic disorder unknown to medicine of the day and aggravated by two major injuries in his youth, Lautrec's leg growth was severely stunned, resulting in him having an adult body with the legs of a child. He never grew past five feet. Physically unable to play with other children, nearly all his focus went to honing his art skills. At the advice of Prince II, Lautrec and his mother moved to Paris in 1882 with the intent to get him into a respected salon. But Lautrec was enchanted by the Montmartre district of Paris and its bohemian lifestyle. Here he befriended fellow artists including Vincent van Gogh and created a massive collection of work documenting the neighborhood. After gaining a name throughout the European art community, in 1888, Lautrec was invited to show 20 of his pieces in Brussels, Belgium. Theo van Gogh, Vincent's brother and noted art dealer, purchased the piece for 150 francs. For the next five years, Lautrec took part in salon shows across Paris and created an impressive catalog of work. He also created posters and advertising art, including promotional materials for the newly opened Moulin Rouge Cabaret. In 1892, he painted his masterpiece titled At the Moulin Rouge. This stunning work has been shown at the Chicago Art Institute since 1930. This piece shows several famous Parisians of the era enjoying a night at the show, including a self-portrait of Lautrec in the background. Sadly, Henri de toulouse lautrecs health declined and after multiple hospital stays and bouts with depression, he passed away at the age of 36 in 1901. Lautrec left behind over 1,000 paintings, over 300 posters, and well over 5,000 sketches from his short but incredible career as an artist. They are on display in museums and enjoyed in private collections around the world. Let's look at more of this incredible artist's work. When we come back, we will be exploring the life of the great Claude Monet. Stay tuned. Today I would like to talk to you about rugs. Three important things to remember when you are buying a rug. First is the size. Size is very important and this is what you have to do your study. So if it's for a living room, I recommend to have the front legs of all the furniture to sit on the certain rug you're buying. So go measure it. Make sure you have at least a foot extended beyond the front legs. If you can afford it, get a rug that encompasses all the furniture to be sitting 
on it. So usually for a living room, you're talking an 8x10, 9x12, a bigger living room, 10x14, and if you want something to sit on it, 12x15 or 12x18. Second, there is a style. It is very important that the style you pick matches the house you have. Check the room, is it a traditional house, is it a modern house, is it a transitional house? You pick the style matching your house and your living style. Lastly, and one of the most important steps is the type of rug you're gonna buy. I highly recommend you to do your study and see what type of rug is good for your situation. Most rugs I recommend are hand knotted. So these are the type of rugs that they're done by hand. They're mostly natural fibers. They don't have any chemicals. They don't have any machines involved making it. They're hand knotted and they get more valuable over the time and they are very durable and long lasting. These are three things to remember when you're buying a rug. Thank you for joining us. This week on Michael's Minute, we are going to talk about rug cleaning and restoration. A fine rug is a family treasure often passed on from generation to generation. Rugs need to be properly taken care of to ensure their survival and protect your investment. At Santa Barbara Design Center, we are the foremost experts in professional cleaning, repairing and preserving your rugs. Rugs should be hand washed every three to five years to maintain the structure. When was the last time you washed your rugs? Proper cleaning can extend the longevity of your rug, whereas the steam cleaning can damage it. Restorations by rugs and more include hand stitching, fixing fringes and sides, and reviving worm pile. For the finest restoration and cleaning, bring your rugs into Rugs and More at Santa Barbara Design Center today, 410 Olive Street. We live in one of the most beautiful locations in the world. I've raised my kids here. I love it here. What we offer at Santa Barbara Design Center isn't just furniture. It's a chance to turn a house into a home. What may look like a deal online, it's very different when it shows up. It's something to be said for feeling it before it becomes part of your life. We are here to help guide you through this wonderful process. We are Santa Barbara Design Center. Come start your journey with us. Welcome back to Design Santa Barbara as we explore the lives of great French artists of the 19th century. We will now be learning the history of the one and only Claude Monet. Born in Paris in 1840, Oscar Claude Monet is known as the father of the Impressionist movement. His family wanted him to work in the grocery business, but from a young age, Claude envisioned himself becoming an artist. After moving around with his family, at the age of 16, Cloud returned to Paris to pursue his passion. Upon visiting the Louvre, he found fellow painters copying great masters and sought to do the same. But when he returned with his supplies, something came over him and he began painting the views out of the museum windows. When he turned 21, he was drafted into the army and sent to North Africa. There he saw light and vivid colors that later influenced his palette. After taking ill in 1862, Monet's aunt secured his discharge from the military on condition that he attend art school. This illusion with the traditional art schools, Monet looked to form his own style with the likes of Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Together they shared new approaches to art, painting the effects of light and plain air with broken color and rapid brush strokes. This later came to be known as Impressionism. By 1865, Claude Monet was looking to present his work at the world-famous Salon de Paris. He envisioned the grand work titled Luncheon on the Grass, but was unable to complete it in time. Instead, he presented The Woman in the Green Dress, using his wife as a model for the first of many times. Despite his gaining popularity, during this time, Monet and his wife lived in abject poverty. He often traded paintings for essentials, and at one point his works were seized by debt collectors. When war broke out in France in 1870, Monet and his family sought refuge in England. This proved to be a pivotal moment for Claude as he had the chance to study the works of British artists such as J.M.W. Turner, who deeply influenced Monet's use of color. 
After being rejected by the British art scene, Monet moved about Europe, producing work and building a catalog. By 1874, Monet and Renoir decided it was time to create an Impressionist exhibit to free themselves of the critical nature of the salon. For an admission of 60 francs or 10 US dollars today, guests could tour the exhibit of 165 paintings. All were for sale, and although attendance topped 3,500, only a few paintings were actually purchased. Think about this. At the exhibition, an original Monet valued today in the millions could be purchased for under $100. In the years following the exhibition, Claude Monet's popularity continued to rise, but the death of his wife at the age of 32 took a heavy toll on him. Renoir's portrait of Monet shows a man attempting to navigate the emotions of loss and creativity. Emerging from his grief, after several months, Monet went on to produce what is considered his best work of the 19th century. After remarrying in 1892, Monet traveled the French countryside and discovered Giverny. This location proved to be a muse to Monet and his paintings were so well received. The profits from them allowed him to purchase a home there. Seeking to shape the style of his landscape, Monet built a greenhouse and contracted seven gardeners to maintain his property from which he took his inspiration. He gave them daily meticulous instructions and expanded his property as his fortunes increased. One such expansion included a pond dotted with water lilies. During World War I, Claude Monet painted a series of weeping willows for his friend and the nation of France's leader, Georges Clemenceau. These paintings were meant to represent the fallen soldiers of France. As Monet grew older, his vision began to fail him. Cataracts on both his eyes led to distinctive reddish tone in his work. And after a successful surgery to remove them, his work turned toward the bluish tone. It is now known that cataract surgery can result in higher ultraviolet vision in patients. After a long career, Claude Monet passed away in his beloved Giverny at the age of 86. He requested a small private memorial with no fanfare and upon the death of his son, his home and gardens were gifted to the French Academy of Fine Arts. Today, Monet is known as one of the world's greatest artists. His works have broke records at auctions and are displayed around the world. Here in Santa Barbara, our Museum of Fine Art has several on display. When we come back, we will be looking at the work of another French master, Paul Cezanne. Stay tuned. Today on Design FYI, we're going to talk about what not to buy when you're going shopping for rugs. Most big outlets or national chains, they sell nowadays hand tufted rugs. This sounds like it's hand knotted, it's done by hand, but actually they are not. It's called hand tufted and it's actually a gun that rolls the wool around the warp and they are not good rugs at all. So this is a sample we're having here for you to see. Anything that has a backing like this. Flip your rugs over at home, see if it has a backing, is absolutely not good. So what it does is it hides what they did below this thing, which is a latex glue, which actually is toxin. And if you have got any rugs over the net, I hate to say it over the net because it's easy to sell and they're inexpensive, you buy these things over the internet. So when it comes to your house, they smell. Have you noticed that? They smell more like a gasoline or more like a diesel because they don't let the latex cure. And the latex that glues this wool to this backing smells a lot. On top of that, they shed quite a lot. The wool is cheap because they need to be inexpensive and they shed. Uh, I would not recommend you to get anything, again, that has a backing and is glued because it comes apart very easily. It is temporary. It is not a green product because they wear very quickly and end up in the fill. And just basically as a landfill junk we are adding to our planet. The things I would recommend you to get, unlike these things that have backing, is the rugs that they have nuts to them. So as what to buy, I highly recommend you to get some rugs that they are hand knotted and how you can see flip it to the back and you can see the knots 
are done individually and each one is slightly different than the next one because they're done by hand and the intensity of the wall and the pool they have the weaver makes them look different. Also the sides are done by hand. That you can see very easily. If you want to buy a real rug, please come to Santa Barbara Design Center and I can gladly help you. Thank you for joining us on Design FYI, Santa Barbara Design Center, Fort Tenale. This week on Michael's Minute, we are going to talk about modern and transitional rugs. At Santa Barbara Design Center, we have over a thousand modern and transitional rugs at any given time in various sizes and colors. A modern or transitional rug can completely transform your living space. It can make a cold room comfortable or balance out an uneven contrast. We can also custom make the modern rug of your dreams, designed to your specification, taste and color. And at Santa Barbara Design Center, we can do it faster, better, for less. That's why the top designers in the world use our modern and transitional rugs. To see our vast collection or start designing your custom masterpiece, come visit us at Santa Barbara Design Center, 410 Olive Street. My grandfather taught me about the beauty of the rugs. Each one tells a story. Story about the person who wove it, the person who bought it, the person who inherits it, the person who treasures it. It's amazing how simply looking at an object can bring you back to a different place and time or remind you of someone you love. At Santa Barbara Design Center, we want to help you find a rug that will travel through time with your family for generations to come. Visit us at 410 Oliver Street and find your treasure today. This week on Design FIR, we're going to talk about sofas and the unknown mistakes people make. Did you know average American spends 46 minutes a day in a car? But they spend 5 hours and 4 minutes on average on a sofa. So why would you go out there and spend tens of thousands of dollars for something to use for 46 minutes and then go ahead and buy something cheap that you sit on it for 5 hours and 4 minutes? At Santa Barbara Design Center, we create your custom sofa that is made for you specifically and to your shape and size and comfort and your family. So when you're sitting and watching TV or talking and conversing with your friends, you're sitting on actually something that represents you. Your car represents you. Why shouldn't your sofa? Thank you for joining us on Design FYI this week and please come see me at Santa Barbara Design Center, Fort and Olive, and let me help you find the right sofa for you and your family. Welcome back to Design Santa Barbara. This week we are exploring great French painters of the 19th century. Now we'll be looking at the life and work of post-impressionist master Paul Cézanne. It is said that no one has had a greater impact on the development of 20th century art than Paul Cézanne. Both Picasso and Matisse were quoted as saying, Cézanne was the father of us all. Cézanne's work laid the foundation of the transition from the 19th century conception of artistic endeavor to a new and radically different world of art. Cézanne's often repetitive exploratory brushstrokes are highly characteristic and clearly recognizable. He used planes of color and small brushstrokes that build up to form complex fields, with paintings conveying Cézanne's intense study of his subjects. Paul Cézanne was born into a prosperous banking family which afforded him financial security throughout his life. His mother was known to have a romantic and vivacious nature, which helped shape his outlook of the world. While in college, Cézanne befriended the novelist Emile Zola. Though encouraged by his parents to become a lawyer, Cézanne studied art on the side and in 1861 decided to move to Paris to pursue painting professionally. Though this decision caused strain with his family, eventually his father reconciled with him and gave Cézanne 400,000 francs to pursue his career, the equivalent to just under a million dollars in today's money. Once in Paris, Cézanne befriended Impressionist Camille Pissarro. 
The two often took excursions to the countryside to paint together. Cezanne's early work focuses on figures and landscapes. Cezanne's paintings were shown in the first exhibition of the Salon des Refuses in 1863, which displayed works not accepted by the jury of the official Paris Salon. The Salon rejected Cezanne's submissions every year from 1864 to 1869. Before 1895, Cezanne exhibited twice with the Impressionists at the first Impressionist exhibition in 1874 and the third Impressionist exhibition in 1877. Let's look at more of these masters' work. He concentrated on a few subjects and was equally proficient in each of these genres. Still lives, portraits, landscapes, and studies of bathers, which Cezanne was compelled to design from his imagination due to a lack of available nude models. Like with landscapes, his portraits were drawn from that which was familiar. His wife and son, local peasants, children, and his art dealer all served as subjects. From 1892 to 1895, Cezanne created one of his masterpieces, the card players. Take a look at the incredible detail of this work and the feeling it evokes. During much of his life, Cezanne drew criticism and scorn within the bourgeoisie. During one showing, his work was laughed at publicly, leading to the town he was living in, asking him to leave out of this honor. Paul Cezanne passed away in 1906 at the age of 67. Much like Vincent van Gogh, in the years after his death, his notoriety increased significantly. Scholars and contemporaries sang his praises. Ernest Hemingway was quoted as saying, Cezanne paints the same way I write. As the 20th century progressed, Cezanne's work drew more and more critical acclaim. By the early 2000s, his work was commanding high seven-figure prices. In 2011, during a private sale, the card players was acquired for an undisclosed sum that is estimated to be over $300 million, making it the second most expensive painting ever sold, behind Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi. I hope you have enjoyed this look into three incredible painters who helped shape art as we know it. I encourage you to explore your local museums and galleries. It will enrich your life. Stay tuned, we will be back after a short break. How many times in the last year have you said to yourself, I really need a new sofa? Spending so much time at home lately, you deserve the most comfortable furniture. At Santa Barbara Design Center's massive showroom, we have numerous selections of sofas and sectionals that you can take home today. Or we can custom build your dream sofa. We make the most comfortable and stylish sofas and sectionals in the industry today. Just ask the top designers in Santa Barbara. They use our sofas and sectionals in their projects because they know clients are beyond satisfied with the results. For a decision as important as this, don't go online or buy from a catalog photo. Come into Fort and Olive Street and let our experienced team help you find the perfect fit for your home. Trust me, you want to sit on it before you buy.
Today on Appraisals, we have this fabulous ancient Turkish rug. So I like things that they are interesting and they have something to tell you. And this particular one I have researched extensively and there was only three of them ever survived from the early 1700s. One is still is in a private collection, this is the other one, and one was in Berlin Art Museum and got destroyed in the Second World War. So this is something that old merchants, uh, 300 years ago, there was not an internet, there was not photos, there was nothing that can go from here. Do you like this design? We make it for you. You like it in 12 by 18, you like it in 6 by 9 like it is today. Very easy communications. It wasn't the such. So the merchants used to take this, they called the sampler to the client's home. And back then was only aristocracy and very wealthy people that could afford these kind of rugs. So they used to get, take it there and they used to show it to prospective buyers. Would you like this medallion or would you like this star medallion? Would you like this minor border, this minor border or this one? Or do you like this? Would you like the ends to have that or would you like the ends to have that? The whole thing can be custom made and they used to take orders, they used to get the deposit and then go back to Turkey. This is called from Ushak, is a town in Anatolia. And then they used to order it. These have survived the ages. I actually have few of these in my own collection, but if you go to Europe and you see those old castles, most likely you will see a combination of this type of designs. One maybe have a star, maybe have a hexagonal uh, medallion, can have this border, that border, and the other, but this is what a sampler is. These are very collectible nowadays. Uh, and as I said, there's only two of these in the whole world nowadays. If you find more, let me know. Uh, is a wool and wool foundation and again very unique item. So fair market value on this beautiful piece is $40,000. If you want to see it please come to Santa Barbara Design Center. Thank you for joining us on the appraisals today.